Uh, so today's topic is uh, building the how we build the data science platform with Airflow at NIR. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm working as a lead data scientist at NIR. Before this, I have worked with a couple of other organizations like FICO and General Electric uh, Digital as a data scientist, and I have around 10 years of experience in data sciences. Uh, to start with, uh, uh, so uh, today we'll be basically talking about uh, how we have deployed, used Airflow to take a model from de uh, development to production. What is the architecture that we're using? Uh, some of the Airflow DAGs and for different use cases, and we'll look at some of the case studies, and then we'll be open for Q&A. To uh, give you a brief introduction about Near, uh, Near was it was it's a company that was incorporated in 2012. Uh, right now, we have a global presence in USA, Europe, Southeast Asia, India, Japan, New Zealand, and we have around eight offices across the globe. With the technology hub being basic um, uh, based mostly out of Bangalore. We've raised a funding of uh, US dollar around 134 million from the likes of Sequoia, JP Morgan, Cisco, Telstra, and uh, in 2020 and 2021 to increase our footprint in US and Europe. We've acquired two major companies in locational intelligence, which are Uber Media and Team. Uh, 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 the sort of data that we work with and the scale of data. So we've around 1.6 billion users from across 44 countries and 70 million places on, in our database. Uh, now to talk about the sort of data that we work with, we have basically two types of data. We get uh, data in terms of an online data of a user and an offline data. In terms of online data, we get uh, the information about, we get mostly the app data of a user. Uh, from the app data, we try to take out what sort of content they are uh, usually consuming, what devices that they are, uh, uh, what is the sort of devices that they are on. And offline data, we get a lot of latitude and longitude data. Uh, we try to figure out what is the lifestyle, interest, uh, visitation history of a person, what sort of uh, aggregator are they coming from, and what is their home location, what is their work location. We combine at NEO, we combine these two data sets to form a data universe, which we call as a NEOverse. And it's basically a platform which gives you a holistic and uh, view of a consumer by combining the online data and the offline. Uh, what NIR does for its clients is what, uh, in terms when we have the data, we run our data models. We, uh, uh, in terms of insights that we generate for our clients, we do it basically at two aggregation levels. One is at a places level. So in terms of places, uh, we give intelligence in terms of like what is the footfall of a place. Uh, how do people move around the mobility pathing around that place? Or what is the home location? How much time do people actually spend at a particular place? In terms, this can be further utilized by our clients for site selection, for competitor uh, intelligence, for supply chain optimization. Uh, the second way we give insights to our uh, consumers, clients are in terms of people insights. So they can see what uh, so uh, what sort of people, uh, demographic of people uh, are the consumers? What is their brand affinity? What are their work location? What are their home locations? What is their social behavior? What is their offline uh, online behavior as well in terms of what they search and what sort of content do they consume? Uh, this helps the brands to get a 360 degree view of their customer. Uh, also, the sort of engagement that they have with their customers in terms of acquiring new customers, showing them targeted marketing ads, and also looking at how uh, the people and places can be combined to see uh, whether you, when you've shown an ad, how do people uh, do people actually show up at the store? What is the attribution for that? So these are the things that we help our clients with. Um, and now we'll just talk about how data science is structured and what are the sort of models that we are working on and how we have used Airflow for the deployment of all the models that we have. Uh, to give you a basic overview of what sort of uh, how, uh, what sort of data science that we are into, uh, so uh, as we have uh, spoken about, that we get a lot of uh, data in terms of the latitude and longitude of a person. Um, so uh, we 
Um, in terms that we have uh, 1.6 billion users, we have 44 countries from where we are getting the data. We get pings of users every 15 seconds. So uh, when we start processing the data at a data science level, um, since we also have an online and offline data, we start with a cross identity. So uh, there can be people who have a number of devices linked to them. There can be people uh, who have, uh, let's say, one device, but uh, it has multiple IDs. So we start with first identifying one particular ID of a person. Uh, these are mostly graph algorithms that we are working on. And again, this is cross identity. Um, again, uh, as I said, that we get pings from users for uh, at every 15 seconds. So this is something that cannot be utilized by any sort of models and cannot be like uh, the number amount of data that would be required to be crunched is huge. So we try to get the uh, the required or the sort of uh, you know the required information from these data points. We come up with the stay points where a person has actually strayed and not or like just moved around. Um, from there, we try to uh, make this data more accurate by associating a ping or a ping of a person to a POI. So we have a database of uh, 17 million uh, plus locations. We have building polygons. We try to associate it which area a user would have visited by using an algorithm called ping to POI. Um, some of the data that we get can also like it's a lot of latitude and longitude GPS data. So it can also come from artificially generated data points. Let's say somebody is mapped to a particular router or a particular IP address and we are getting all the pings from there. So we try to remove these pings and we do something like a high density points and to improve the data accuracy. Once we have these uh, models running, we uh, try to uh, what we uh, then we work on actually generating or, or working on the models or generating insights from those models. So uh, we then derive the user behavior. Let's say in terms of we try to profile the user in terms of what gender they are from, what is their age group, what is their uh, are they a traveler, are they a shopper, what sort of interests do they have, what is their brand mm -hmm. affinity and uh, their home location, their work location, and uh, uh, and then we generate insights for our con uh, customers for that. Uh, we also provide uh, our clients with an estimation. So this is basically for targeted marketing. So let's say you're a uh, client and you want your Procter & Gamble and you want to see, um, okay, I'll not take the example of Procter & Gamble. Uh, let's say you're Marks & Spencer and you want to see how many people are visiting Marks & Spencer in London on uh, all the stores in Marks & Spencer's within a bound of, let's say, 100 meters. And you can, uh, in a real time, you can see the actual estimate of what would be the per, uh, uh, sort of audience that you can get. So based on that, you can derive your campaigns, right? You can like uh, run it on. Uh, so you can um, imagine that maybe 100 meters would be too small of a radius for me. Uh, I'm not getting a sufficient set of audience. I might want to increase it. I might also want to target some of the competitor brands, maybe like look at maybe Aldi or other brands and then give an estimate. So, uh, so uh, this is where a real-time estimation is being utilized. Uh, all the models that uh, we've seen here, so like the foundational mo uh, models, the data accuracy model, the user behavior models, everything right now uh, has been pipelined on Airflow for us. And uh, I'll just talk about the architecture and how the Airflow is being deployed at uh, NIR. Um, so as a data scientist, um, I'm exposed to the edge node. And most of us, uh, we are a team of six, seven people, and we are exposed to the edge node. Uh, we have Airflow installed on the edge node and these are some of the configurations on which the airflow has been uh, installed like celery executor because we work on PySpark and we have a large amount of data that comes in we uh, work a lot on parallelization uh, there's mysql database for storing metadata uh, then there are incoming webhooks python environment um, as a data scientist, what are the benefits for uh, you know bringing uh, so setting up this architecture for me so uh, the first is the ease of deployment. Uh, that's one reason we have like uh, we've explored cron jobs, we've explored data pipelines. So uh, and we are sticking to Airflow because of the ease of deployment. There's a lot of Python scripting that is involved, and most of the data scientists are. Uh, 
very much comfortable with it. So uh, this makes it easier for us to deploy it. Then uh, there is a scalability. So uh, uh, let's say I have a certain um, I have a certain algorithm which helps me detect, uh, which helps me predict the gender of uh, my, in my data. So now uh, when I'm working with 44 different countries, I cannot have 40. I will have to have 44 different jobs running because these have to be models, these scoring models, everything has to be specific to a country or a region so uh, we have algorithms where we make minor tweaks and uh, when we need to scale them across countries across uh, hours uh, across jobs we do it through airflow which makes it very very easier for us uh, also um, since the amount of data we crunch is huge we do a lot of parallelization uh, we uh, there is a as an Airflow user, you also get the benefit of a task dependency management, right? Um, so this becomes important. Let's say I have a certain process which requires me as a data scientist to do some EDA, do a feature creation, clean the data sets. Uh, as you can see, our models are uh, deployed in a way with the foundational models. Then we have something like accuracy models, which go and feed into the user models. So uh, we manage that sort of dependency. Once one job is triggered, then the another job gets triggered and it becomes very easy over the airflow. Um, also, uh, uh, we have our data stored in S3, but when we have the final, uh, we need to, once the models run, the whole pipelines runs, we need to push them to different platform APIs, uh, Presto DB, Redis, different types of DBs. We keep on connecting to them. So Airflow makes it very easier to connect with different systems. Uh, there is always like uh, monitoring and alerting is uh, one of the key benefits. Like we get alerting systems, a Slack alerts one, a, a, if any job fails, and rerunning becomes very very easier. Uh, moving on, so as a data scientist, the sort of environment we operate in. So uh, the most of the work that we do is in the development uh, environment. Uh, 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 right now, we just have three environments, uh, development, staging, and production. So uh, staging and production are a replica of the development environment. Uh, but as a data scientist, I'm mostly exposed to the development environment. So uh, what I do here is I do a local execution in terms of my EDA, then I'll work on feature engineering, model training, performance evaluation. I'll also, when I I'll also set up my airflow DAGs and everything in this particular development environment and test them out thoroughly. Once I have done that, I'll uh, commit my codes to GitHub. I'll uh, deploy them through Jenkins and uh, I'll branch out of those uh, uh, GitHub if I need to do any more development work. But in the staging environment, only as a data scientist, an airflow is exposed to me. So I can see the airflow of the edge node, uh, but I cannot really work on a staging environment. And uh, we have a particular structure that we follow when we take our uh, models or our codes, everything to the uh, staging environment. Uh, we have a project name, and then we divide it into DAGs and scripts, and everything uh, is located in those particular things. And uh, there is a lot of testing that happens here. So the product testing will product will look at uh, different scenarios. We'll do a code testing. Any changes that need to be made would be made through the development environment again and go to the staging. And we package it and dockerize it. And finally, uh, it goes to the production environment. So production environment is uh, something that is not being managed by data science at all. Uh, so this goes to either the engineering team who monitors and sets up alerts, does a production API integration, CI, CD pipelines, or the uh, DevOps team. Uh, we have, when we talk about how we are utilizing Airflow for our data science models, we basically three types of uh, modes in which we are operating. One is the batch mode. So something like, uh, let's say I get a uh, data every uh, day or every hour i get some amount of data from a different ad exchange or a partner right so um we run cross matrix uh, on them we run uh, every hourly uh, job for 
figuring out the state points. So these are all batch mode data sets. Once we have these data sets ready, there are certain user models. There are certain accuracy models which would run maybe daily in terms of an HTTP or places assignment or ping to POI assignment. Then we'll have some user models such as figuring out the gender, age group, or profile of a person, which will be mostly a home location or a work location, which will be mostly a weekly run. So these are our batch mode models. Then uh, the platform that we have, there is a lot of on-demand models uh, aggregation that happens. So these are the aggregated insights that are shown to a, a user. So in terms, let's say I'm a client for near, I come on the platform. Uh, I want to see how many people, uh, uh, what are the basic, uh, like, uh, what are what is the profile associated with people visiting McDonald's or let's say Dunkin' Donuts or uh, KFC. And uh, I can create cards there and I can save those cards. I can save the data set. And uh, this will further trigger uh, jobs in terms of uh, airflow jobs in terms of on-demand model and which will generate aggregated insights for me. A uh, dynamic mode is where we do a lot of campaigns for our clients as well. So uh, the clients have the uh, the clients can uh, get the intelligence from us, and based on our intelligence, they can also run certain campaigns. Now, the thing with campaigns is that campaigns isn't something uh, like the campaign IDs are. They are not fixed, right? So they run for a period of 15 to let's say 90 days then there are new ids that come in the campaign stop so uh, these are very dynamic uh, dags that we have and uh, the ids of the dags and everything or the sort of dags that we are, are populating change with the sort of campaign ids we have uh, so um, in terms, uh, so I have taken care, a case study for estimation, uh, one of the projects where, where we were estimating the audience reach, then uh, a, a project that we'd done on finding the, uh, on generating insights for campaigns and on uh, our product, which is all Spark, we're generating insights for that. So these three are the different types of uh, 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 airflow uh, modes that we are operating in. Estimation would be a batch mode. Uh, campaign IDs, again, would be a dynamic mode. And insights would be, again, uh, uh, an on-demand mode. So I'll just take you through the case studies and codes for each of these. Uh, so estimation, um, just to, gi uh, to give you a brief introduction of how estimation works is, let's say you go on our platform, you pick up a certain location. Let's say you want to see how many um, people have visited tourist location in the past 30 days. And uh, and uh, so uh, you can do that through our platform. You can also like see uh, for any sort of locations, right? Within uh, for all the countries that we are present for. So you can go to any site of sort of locations like uh, maybe tourist location you want to see. You also want to see people who have visited cinema or you go to amusement parks. And uh, there are various configurations also which you can like set. You can look at people who are within 100 meters of, our, uh, of the radius. We can expand to one mile. And uh, in terms of people, uh, we have different profiling for peoples as well. So you can look at whether, uh, you know, number of males visiting a Mercedes showroom or number of females going to a Marks and Spencer. So those kind of profiles are also available. And based on these set of configurations that you want to see, we provide you an accurate estimation. So the, the whole uh, workflow for estimation, it happens, it is designed in a way that you get an estimate within 30 seconds. So, um, one of the key challenges here is that estimations are not fixed, right? So uh, when we get the data, we are changing the estimation every day. So there'll be new people coming up. There'll be old IDs that will be churning. So uh, let's say in a scenario like COVID-19, right, where you'll see uh, the people visits going down across time. So the, uh, this is something that will start reflecting once you start using a platform. Uh, also, uh, this is a very central part of our product. So uh, there is uh, no scope for, uh, we do not want any downtime for this. So this has to be there available for all the clients all the time. And um, 
and we wanted the whole process to be automated right so starting from you know daily accumulation of people ids to aggregating and then like getting in, into a uh, redis instance or any db is something uh, that had to be completely automated because this is a daily process and cannot be like you cannot have one person data sciences dedicated to managing this platform um also um in terms of that we um so um because this is a um, uh, the sort of estimations that we get they are very real time like you get them in uh, 30 seconds so we had we had utilized different sort of databases for this our uh, input data usually resides in s3 and uh, in terms of getting the output data we had to go for an in memory sort of uh, db which where we chose redis so um, the how the estimation works is let's say you have 1.6 million users in across 44 countries and 70 million places. So we divide the whole world into smaller grids and we do some sort of daily accumulation of people IDs across those grids. We look at what profiles they are, how frequently they are visiting. And uh, then across a time period, let's say from seven days to 30 days to 15 days to 60 and 90 days, we aggregate them. This in turn launches another set of, once these processes are finished, we trigger another sort of DAGs, which, uh, so there are one uh, sort of Redis instances which are currently in the production. There'll be one Redis instances which would be wait, which would be waiting to get the data updated to them. So uh, we'll, trigger, we'll look at what instance is currently running on the production system. We'll turn on the uh, alternate instance and uh, we'll uh, take a dump of all the data that was there and uh, because we do not want any downtime and we want to ensure that there is always a back up of the data even if any sort of failures happen so we take a dump of them and then we restart redis and we start pushing it through db uh, to the redis uh, now uh, since we had a task of uh, getting this humongous amount of data from s3 to redis so we've utilized uh, we've explored a lot on how we can do it uh, to uh, uh, in um, so uh, how we can do it at the fastest of the speed. So we've utilized Spark Redis for this, and we've tried to integrate the jar files with the DAGs and then push them to the DB. Once everything is completed, we want the new uh, the uh, production APIs to start pointing to the new DB, which was fully loaded, and then uh, and then uh, stop the previous DB that was there because the cost of running these servers is also huge. So we want to stop them whenever we have flipped to a new one. Uh, let's look at some of the code snippets here. So uh, this is where we are like, uh, the first one is uh, I've removed, I'm not uh, really looking at the daily accumulation or aggregation over a time period because these are very simpler DAGs that were implemented. Uh, in terms of how we were looking at um, uh, how we were pointing to a different, uh, how we're pointing to the production API. Uh, the first DAG that is a bash operator, it will usually uh, pass on a curl command, get the current uh, instance that is running on the production API. Uh, the Redis instance, uh, the function Redis instance will in turn point to the alternate uh, Redis instance. So it will flip it. Uh, this flipped instance will again um, trigger another job where we've defined, let's say, trigger um, a dummy DAG, a, a, a DAG for uploading to Y instance. Let's say I had X instance and now I want to upload to Y instance. I have uh, defined all the uh, parameters for that particular instance, the IP, the host, and everything. And it will trigger those uh, DAGs. Uh, once these DAGs are triggered, these will have a subsequent sub DAGs. So uh, we'll start with uh, you know starting a dummy instance, let's say Y1, and then uh, there is a bash operator for delay uh, that we've put in because um, usually uh, starting of instances takes some time, and we do not want the other commands to like uh, we needed some commands to clear and restart and take a dump of the Redis. So before that, we delay uh, it by five minutes, and then we fire the other commands. Once all of this is completed, 
we start uploading the redis and uh, this is how we are utilizing it so most of these are application uh, these are java jars and these are basically spark redis spark redis is also something that's uh, currently a very uh, experimental sort of jars. We had made a lot of changes to the connectors and we've passed them as an application here. And once you have them, you can like push a file path that was in S3 through a uh, Spark Redis to the Redis. And once that, all the processes of uh, pushing all sort of files have been completed, then you can again uh, point to the current instance and stop the previous instance. Uh, moving on to on-demand workflows. So this is uh, 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 an example of how insights have been con uh, configured and how the workflow for, uh, in Airflow has been designed for our insights. Once you have uh, selected an audience, you've created a card, uh, you've saved that audience. Now you want to be able to get the insights on that audience. So whenever that happens, whenever you've like saved that audience, it will trigger a curl based uh, trigger to the airflow. It will pass on that trigger. Uh, we'll be extracting some metadata from this curl based trigger and uh, start various processes of like, uh, let's say, extracting the seed users, then aggregate models running over Bayesian models with some prior information running for spatial insights to uh, come up with the insights on what sort of home location are people coming from, uh, what is the average distance travel, what are the footfalls. And then, uh, uh, and then this will be integrated with the API, so production layer API, where once this is all the processes are com com completed, they'll be pushed to the API. The third sort of uh, workflow that we have implemented is the dynamic workflow. So in terms of the dynamic workflow, we this was basically done for the campaigns that are running. So uh, in terms of that, we get some data for all the campaigns and we need to generate, we already have the user models for all those profiles or all those users. We need to generate insights on all those users by using some Bayesian, uh, Bayesian uh, algorithms and prior information. And uh, what we do here is, uh, what was very different here was that in this case, uh, so campaigns change from uh, run from a 15 to 90 days period. And we want to be able to visualize what has failed and what is still running every time. So uh, we needed to uh, generate insights for these campaigns. So uh, campaign IDs are not fixed. They will keep on changing. So what we did was, uh, here is a snippet of the code. Uh, so uh, we uh, what we do is we do some sort of daily aggregation. We write the campaign IDs back to S3. Then we, through the Airflow DAG, we read those campaign IDs. Then we generate some dynamic sub DAGs, which will run on these specific uh, uh, IDs and generate insights for these particular IDs. So this is uh, a code that does that. So it basically reads through the, I've not uh, shown the code where we're writing it to the S3 file system, but we're, uh, we're reading it from the S3 file system. Then we are reading all the IDs. Uh, the IDs are passed as Airflow variables into the other sub, sub DAGs, which can then generate the dynamic sub DAGs. Uh, yeah. So um, I think this was one of the part where we faced a lot of challenges because when uh, dynamic uh, DAGs or uh, dynamic workflows are concerned, Airflow um, uh, fails in terms of the visualization. There were a lot of issues that we faced in terms of uh, a lot of processes going into the queued status and um, the uh, in terms of visualization, like something uh, was uh, some DAG, uh, some campaign ID was there 10 days back, but is not present today. So how do you visualize it? Um, this worked very well for us when we had a smaller number of campaign IDs, let's say around 100, 200. But we, when we started moving on to like 1,000 of IDs, then uh, we had to change this to a more curl-based approach where we were not able to visualize the campaign IDs. But yeah, but in terms of running it, we were able to run it. Uh, 
so um in terms of our future work what we are planning we would be moving on to some reinforcement learning and graph based networks and some deep learning networks and uh, will be like uh, working uh, trying to integrate these into the airflow as well we uh, plan to continue working on the airflow because this has worked very well for us for all the models that we have currently in the production which includes our um, uh, 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 on-demand models or uh, our batch mode models. This has worked very well, so without any failures for us. Uh, we're also planning to upgrade to a newer version of uh, Airflow, introduce security and dockerization. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, that's it from our end. Thank you. Any questions, Liz?